the entire thing. Or, um, I do appreciate that, that it's, that it's not a waste. Today, we are strictly focusing on dividing complex numbers. And I saved this one because it's just got some more components to it. And it's not going to be a long lesson, but it would have been too much to tack on to the last one that we had. Still the two most important pieces of information that you will have is that I equals the square root of negative one and that I squared equals negative one, right? And that's really the most important thing that we're talking about when it comes to complex numbers or imaginary numbers, right? It's how, how do we deal with that I? Um, when we're doing the operations in and of themselves, we just treat it like a variable, right? Just like it was an X or a Y, we combine like terms with it. The only time we ever have to change anything in terms of that with an I is when we get I squared, we change it to negative one at the end. And all that does, it, it serves to change the sign of whatever it's being multiplied to. That's literally all it does. And so <clears throat> when we're dividing complex numbers, there is a rule. And that rule is no imaginary numbers in the denominator. That means if I have a fraction and there is an I on the bottom, I have to get rid of it. And I can't just throw it away. I have to turn it into a real number. But the cool thing about imaginary numbers or complex numbers is they have what we call a conjugate that can make them real. Now, if I have a simple, well, before I get into that, because I was about to start dividing, but let's talk about what the conjugate is first, right? We have something that we call complex conjugates. Complex numbers come in pairs. It's what makes them real numbers. When I have a problem, right? say I have X squared plus one equals zero and I want to solve it. We're not looking at something with an I in it, right? We can't look at that and go, well, that's not real because every component in it right now is real, right? X squared is real. One is real. But when we go to solve it and we subtract that one from both sides and we have X squared equals negative one, and then we have to take the square root of both sides. That's when we lose the real, right? We go, okay, well, nothing times itself equals negative one. And that was where we came up with I, right? Or plus or minus I. But in a regular equation, you don't see an I. It's not used as a variable. And the reason for that is complex numbers come in pairs. If I have a plus I, I also have a minus I, right? And what does that make? It makes one or it changes the sign of whatever it's next to, right? Whatever it's being multiplied to. And so when we look at things as more complex, like we weren't necessarily just dealing with imaginaries in this sense, we were talking about things that are in the form of a plus b i, right? This is our complex number. It's the standard form of a complex number, right? It's always written in this fashion where we have a real term, right? And then we have an, our, our imaginary term, right? 
Complex numbers, though, always come in conjugate pairs. So if I have an A plus BI, I also have the conjugate, which is A minus BI. Knowing what the conjugate is is always easy. It does not matter what the sign of A is in either of these. It will stay the same. What changes on these for the conjugate is the sign in the middle, right? So if I have eight plus I, its complex conjugate would be eight minus I. If I have negative three minus two I, its conjugate would be negative three plus two I, right? Finding the conjugate itself is super easy. And one of the cool things about having a conjugate, let's say I have eight plus I times eight minus I, if I multiply a complex number, times its conjugate, look at what happens. So we're going to take each piece, right? We've got a, you call it foil. I call it distribution because I hate the term foil. It's like a peeve of mine. It only works with binomials. But I foil, right? I take my eight and I multiply it times eight and I have 64. And then I'm going to multiply it times the other piece, which is minus I. And I wind up with negative eight I. And I've played out eight, right? I've multiplied it times each piece. And so now I'm going to play my I that way. I'm going to go I times eight is plus eight I. I'm going to go I times negative I is negative I squared. Pay attention to this part. What happens when we multiply something times its conjugate is the imaginary goes away, right? If I look at this problem right now, I've got 64 minus 8i plus 8i goes away, right? That's just zero. And I'm left with negative i squared. But what does i squared equal? Right, Sergio, excellent. Negative one. So what does that give me here? If I look at this, I go, okay, well, I've got 64 minus I squared. Well, that's just negative one. And so that's just really 64 plus one, which is 65. We got a real number solution for that complex number. The important thing to see, because it'll save you having to write this over and over again, is if you notice all this I squared does right here, is it changes this sign, right? This just became plus one. Because when we multiply anything times negative one, all it does is change the sign, right? What if we tried it with, ooh, I didn't mean to do that. I was trying to move the whole thing. I went, Stop it. I was trying to move the screen and it's just insisting on writing on me. If I were to multiply my negative three minus two I times negative three plus two I, right? I look at that, I can go, okay, well that's negative three times negative three, that's positive nine. Negative three times two I is negative six I. Negative two I times negative three, well that's plus six I. And negative two times positive two I is negative four I squared. If I look at this problem, what happens is these cancel, right? Negative six I plus six I. And here I'm left with nine. See this I squared? All it's going to do is change that sign. And this becomes plus four. Did everyone see what I did there? This I squared, all it does is it changes this sign and we wind up with plus four. And so we wind up with 13.
Now, why would I be telling you this before we get into division? Why? Why would I be doing that? I'll tell you, because we need it for division. We, as I said here, cannot have imaginary numbers in the denominator, which means that we need to what we call rationalize the denominator. And the way that we do that is by using complex conjugates. Now, in the beginning, if we have a pure imaginary number and we're dealing with it, say I have um, 10 over 2i, right? 2i is a pure imaginary number. There's nothing added or subtracted from it. Anytime you have a pure imaginary number, right? Here we have 10 divided by 2i. To rationalize the denominator, all I have to do is multiply times i over i. Why would I multiply times i over i and not just i? I don't need to rationalize the numerator. Why would I multiply times i over i? Just think about it for a second. Excellent, Valerie, because it's one. Two over two equals one. Seven over seven equals one. X over X equals one. Anything over itself equals one because we're talking about parts of a whole. Yes, zero over zero is undefined. You are right. But otherwise, anything over itself is just one. 8 million and 3 over 8 million and 3 is 1. Because what are we saying? We're saying, well, this is how many parts make the whole, right? We're saying something is divided into four parts. It's divided by four. If I have a circle and it's divided by four, it means that it's in four parts, right? Three-fourths means that I have three-fourths of that circle, right? It's how many parts of the whole that I have. It's three divided by four. When I want to rationalize this, if I have four parts of four, I have the whole thing, right? Which is just one, right? It takes up the whole piece, right? So when I multiply times I over I, I'm actually just multiplying times one. I'm not changing the value of what I'm doing, right? And we are allowed to have an I in the numerator. So when I multiply 10 times I, I wind up with 10 I over two I times I. Well, that's just two I squared. But what is I squared? Everybody should be typing that answer into the box right now. When I say, what is I squared? Every single person should be typing that solution into the box because it's the most important thing I've taught you in the last few days. I've mentioned it several times, right? It's just negative one, right? And so it just changes the sign of this too. So right now I wind up with 10 over, sorry, 10 I over negative two. 10 divided by negative 2, well, that's just negative 5i. That's our solution, right? And when we have pure imaginary numbers, it's really easy because we're just dealing with i over i. Sometimes it'll get more compli complicated, just like English. And I'll have to do a little bit more work. I'll have to do some distribution. Like if I have, for example negative eight minus two i over six i, right? I'm still gonna multiply this times i over i. 
I just have to distribute this to each piece, right? So I wind up with negative 8i times negative 2i squared. And I'll deal with that mess in a minute over 6i squared, right? And then I can fix this because I know that my i squareds are just going to change the signs, right? So now I have negative 8i plus 2, right? The i squared just becomes negative 1, and it changes this sign, and the i squared goes away. Over, well, 6i squared, that's just negative 6. Can I leave this fraction like this? No. If I get this far on a piece of paper, Right? If you're doing a test and I ask you to do something like this and you get this far, I'll be like, you're amazing, but I'll knock a point off. But I won't knock all 10 points off. Right? <laughs> Reduce your fraction. Every single thing here is divisible by two. Right? So this can be negative 4i plus 1. 2 divided by 2 is 1. Negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. Technically, I can't even leave it like that, right? Because I don't have my real num real term first. Oh, see, I hate this new whiteboard. So I would actually write this as negative. I can't take this anymore. Give me back my old whiteboard. Negative 1 third minus actually plus, right? Negative over negative is a positive, plus four thirds i, right? Can I write it as negative one plus four i over three? Yes, I can. Both are right. But if you're reducing the fraction and you wind up with different denominators, then you have to separate them. So this is correct, and this is correct. But are we done yet? Heck no. These are the simple ones, right? Because we haven't even brought into the play the conjugates yet. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to do it quickly because we only have seven minutes left. If I have a problem, I have lots of problems, but if I have the mathematical problem, of, let's go with negative 2 over 5 minus i. Sometimes it'll be in parentheses, sometimes it won't. I always put it in the parentheses because I know I have to put the next part in the parentheses. I can't just multiply times i now. It doesn't work because this is a, com a, a complex number, right? We have a real number plus or minus the imaginary number, which means that we actually need to multiply times the conjugate. So five plus I, but just like before, I can't just do it to the bottom. I also have to do it to the top. And the reason for that is, is it's still just like multiplying times one, right? We're still not changing the value. Why can't we have an I in the denominator? I don't know. Probably because we want a real number. We want to divide by a real number, right? Maybe because mathematicians are cruel. I don't know. So here I've got to distribute. This is negative 2 times 5 plus I. So I have to go negative 2 times 5. Well, that's negative 10. And then I have to go negative 2 times I. Well, that's negative 2I. The bottom, I'm going to do the math down below and then put it in here. Why? Because I don't want to do all the work right here and then have to keep moving it. Here I'm multiplying 5 minus i times 5 plus i. All of my imaginary components are going to drop out. And I wind up with 5 times 5 is 25. And I go with 5 plus i. And 5 times negative positive i is plus 5i. Then I'm going to go negative 5i times 5 is negative 5i. So see, we can see these already are going to drop out. 
And then I have negative i times positive i, which gives me negative i squared. These drop out 5i minus 5i is just 0. And I am left with 25 minus i squared. But what is i squared? Negative i squared is just plus 1. So my solution there is 26. Again, can I leave it like this? No. Reduce that fraction. Everything's divisible by 2. So this can be negative 5 minus i over 26 divided by 2 is 13. That is my solution. Sometimes you're going to have a complex number over a complex number, and you're going to have to distribute both of them out, right? It's not always going to be this easy. See how I called that easy? But it is okay because you guys are amazing, and I know that you can handle it better than I can handle this new whiteboard change that's killing me. It's absolutely killing me. Um, I do want to do one that's harder, but I really don't have a I have two minutes before the bell rings. I don't want to keep you late for your next class. Um, but what can I tell you? You're just going to have to miss on, out on that awesome example because we got chatty. Um, maybe I'll record my class tomorrow too. Like I'll post this one. And if I get through all the examples tomorrow, then I'll post that video instead. I'll change them. All right. I do want for you guys to have a fantastic week off. Um, you have 10 problems. They are all in uh, Delta math. Um, if you want to cheat on half of them and do the other half, fine. I don't care. I have no way of knowing, but understand how to do it. Well, that was weird, Jacob. Yeah, your cousin needs to be uh, off of that sucker. <laughs> so have yourself a great break. Do something fun. If you're behind, get caught up. Otherwise, chill. Have some fun. Play video games or go to a movie or the beach or hang out with people you like. I hope you enjoy your week.